I just like to say to you to start out, I am a proud member of the body of Christ. And uh, I've decided to be his love slave. Now, I've not been coerced to do it. I haven't been forced to do it. But because of what he's done for me and what he's taught me in his word and what he's done in the way of changing my whole life, my whole life's approach. And I just can't help but say I am a love slave. Now, listen, one of the words that describes the Lord is Adonai. Say it with me, Adonai. That's the Hebrew word for master. So if he's a master, he's got to have people that are sequacious and obedient and obey him. Say, I am a love slave. Let me hear you say it. That's good. As ardent believers, we are the vanguard, if you please, of the spiritual influence in the world. God was very poignant about the matter of separating Israel from other nations and wanting their exclusive worship. God instructed them explicitly how to worship him. And they were to utterly destroy all false forms of worship and be separated only unto God. And that was Israel's biggest sin. They never was satisfied just to serve him. They always had to have some idol. They had to have something else in the way. And God was very displeased. For a man's worship is absolutely necessary, and it's important to God. Remember what I've been trying to instruct you about God's personality. God wants you to want him. He's not going to force you. If you're saying, well, I've got two kids out there, and they're living in sin. Well, just remember this. You can pray for them, and God will send his Holy Spirit to convict them, but they will never be forced. Everybody that comes to the, in the kingdom of God may be influenced, by what they see, what they go through, and all that. But the Holy Spirit is very gentle. When he comes, if you reject him, he just backs away. He's just very tender like that. Because God wants you to want him. And I mentioned the other day, you know, don't you want your kids to want you, your grandkids to love you and want to be around you? Don't you want, you want your wife to want you? And, and husbands, don't you want to want your wife? And wife, don't you want somebody that wants you? And husband, want somebody that wants it? I mean, otherwise, it's a very miserable existence. I know people that stay together when they don't have love for each other and they have just drifted apart. But it's a very miserable existence. And God knows. He, you know, remember that God created us after his image. Isn't that right? He said, we created man after our image, our image. Well, his image. So we have, some, we have a lot of traits that God has. Now, the sin has marred it. The curse has marred it. But underneath that, we have the capacity to serve him. And we have the capacity to love him with all our might. And we'll see later on as we look in, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 where it talks about that love that he, he asked from us. So he wants that sanctified worship. And it vitally connects us to the ultimate purpose that he has for us. The worship of God ought to be tenacious. It shouldn't just be some, you know, just so, well, we just got there. Yeah, we just barely, you know, like something the cat drug in and we can't wait to get out. Oh, my Lord, look how late he's gone, my Lord. We're going to miss, we're going to be the last ones to go to the restaurant. You know, we really are, we're characters. All right, no, I didn't expect you to shout me down just because I tell the truth up here. I was doing the best I can with what I have to work with here. But he wants that worship. And it's the mechanism, now listen, it's the mechanism by which God is going to bring about the change necessary. If you're a Christian, you're in the midst of changing. If you think you've arrived, then you became a, you've become a big smart aleck and you're not, very, you're not worth very much. It's, you know, I hate to be around somebody who think they know it all. You've heard of people like that. And don't you say that about me, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I will not pray another prayer for you. But you, you know what I mean, though, you, you know. So there is a, there's an attitude problem. So God wants us to be a facsimile of him. I mean, he, he were to be a copy of who he is. He's the template. He, he lays out what is best for us. We often think that he's trying to take something from us. I've known a lot of people through the years that I've tried to work with and get them to the Lord. They may have been a mate of somebody unsaved and whatever it is. And they're so afraid that they're going to have to give up something. And what they give up is going to be so lost 
and they're going to be so miserable and so empty without what they were holding on to. Might be that drug, that booze, might be that illicit sex that goes on outside of marriage or whatever. And so, but he leaves no room for that. Let's look at Deuteronomy 6, 5. Can we get that up? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Not just on Valentine's Day. How many forgot to get your sweetheart a Valentine card? Never mind. 22 demerits for you. Remember in school, you got demerits. So I give you some. You, let's say it's read together. Read out loud with me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Does it look like there's any weasel room in that statement? He wants it all. Brother Dana mentioned earlier how we feel about how God is just leading us. We're just trying to go day by day, following his direction. But we're all in it. We're not holding back. We trust each other implicitly. And we're working together and we're seeing good things happen. And we, uh, the half is not, wait till we start telling you about some of the stuff that's happening. We can't right now, but sometime I'm going to tell you. The copy of what we worship. We worship Christ and we're to be like, more like him in the name of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Boy, I want to get these in here. But we all, we're all in it, as I said. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being, in the process, transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Something is happening. You're not just coming, being a bump on the log. Something is happening. Often when people come in the prayer line and they've come before, and I know that God began something to them, often I will pray, Lord, complete the miracle that you began in them. You want to know that when you pray immediately, God puts something in action. There's something happening. And so always approach it that way and give him the thanks for the beginning of the miracle. Now, we're obviously... Obviously, always looking for the end result as well. So there's no compromise with God. He wants it all. And he's just concerned about, he's just as concerned about the New Testament people as he was in the old. That he said, love me with all your heart, with all your strength. And he wants the same for us in the New Testament. So we need to not be myopic in this because God's been very plain what he asks of us. Let's look at John chapter 4 verse 24. God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There's a spiritual something that happens in a service like this. That's why he says, forsaking not the assembly of yourself together as the manner of some is. Because there's something that happens when born again believers. Brother Danny talks, talks about it often when he talks about synergy. You know, one puts a thousand to flight, two puts ten thousand. You see how it's not just multiplication, actually. Multiplication is involved, but synergy is much more than multiplication. Because we're talking about if two, one person can put a thousand to flight, then two people can put how many? Ten thousand to flight, isn't that right? So let's take a look at what God has done this. Now, if you build a house or a building like this, obviously at one time or another, somebody set the plans for this. But generally speaking, you hire what we call a general contractor. If you're going to build a house or a building, a general contractor. Now, that general contractor is responsible for getting that building built. But that general contractor does not necessarily do the building himself. If you've ever watched how this works, there are subcontractors. The contractor hires subcontractors. And they come in and they may dig the basement out. And they may put the footer in, and they may bring the block up to three, three deck high or whatever it is, and then they're out of the picture. And then you may bring framers in, and they frame the building, they put the trusses on. You may have a different roofer. You certainly have different electricians and plumbers and so on. So you have subcontractors, but God is the general contractor. And God has subcontracted much of the work to the governmental ministries that he has set in the church, it was mentioned in the first game, remember this is a double hitter, including the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And what are they to do that he's placed them in the church to do? To promulgate the message. Ephesians chapter 4, let's take a look at it. Begin with verse 11. He himself, 
not some hierarchy, not some denomination, but he himself gave some to be apostles. Didn't give all to be the same, but he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. All right, so far? Why? For the equipping of the saints. Now, this is why. Now, let me lay this out. Not everybody's going to like me on this. But there are too many people that because they were a Sunday school teacher or because they got inspired in the service or whatever and feel a call to preach, presume that they are part of the fivefold ministry and attempt to lead a congregation when they do not have the ability to do it. They do not have the experience because it takes more than just getting a Sunday school teacher can get up and teach. Some of them teach very good, better than some preachers. So it's more than just teaching because actually when God calls you into one of these ministries, you have to manage people's lives. You have to guide them. You have to be able to give them advice. And not everybody's equipped to do that. So we should understand that's why it's worded that way. He gave some apostles, some pro- to give everybody that. And there's plenty of people that have the same urge. In fact, I would say this, that almost everybody that falls in love with Jesus and really gets into the Word of God wishes that they could do it full time. Isn't that right? And so I just want to throw that in there. Now, why is it that it's important that the right people answer the call, and God knows what he's doing. He's the one that does. He's the general contractor. We're just subcontractors. Remember that. Now watch why, why we're raised up. For, see, I knew they'd get quiet, Brother Dana. I knew that when I, when I, when I get down, down, when I get down, they, they kind of back up a little bit. But it's all right. I, can, I got scripture to support me. I'm not worried. Here we go. For, read with me, the equipping of the saints. Who do they equip? The saints, well, you got to have something before you can equip somebody else. For the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that's such an important part. Now watch how long this goes on. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. See, there's no excuse to be weak in the church, be uninformed, and not know the Word of God. There's no excuse for it. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. That's how you get tricked. That's how people deceive you when you're not equipped. It's just like people that have somebody knock on the door and be promised some bigger reward if they'll sign this or do this. And a lot of times they, they just, sometimes they prey on the elderly, and I feel sorry for the elderly. But, but they tend to pick on them. Well, I say they try to pick on us, but when they pick on me, I know what I'm talking about, bless God, I'll wind up and, real, and I'll give them something from the Word of God. No, you know what I mean, though. They just try to take advantage of anybody they can, not just the elderly, obviously, everybody. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. That should end. We should start to grow up, know who we are, stand on our own two feet, and be able to quote the Word of God. When the devil comes in like a flood, my Lord, you can raise up a standard against him in the name of Jesus. Every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness, believe me, if these jerks, that are working out, uh, outside the law, if they would spend the energy and the ideas and, the, and, the, and the, the, what shall I say, the art they have, for the good, they could probably be successful. But the dummies don't have any better sense. They'd rather come and b- break the wind in your house and come in and take what you've worked hard to get and just come in there while you old foul thing, you, I just hope you get caught and everything like that, stuff like that. Say, well, I, I pray for them, brother. Dave. I feel sorry. I do too. I pray that um, there'll be some, somebody come into jail and pray for them while they spend behind bars and stuff like that. Oh, I'm spitting already. I'm telling you, I'm really, I'm really getting with this. Cunning craftiness, say hey, they're smart as a whip. But the Bible says we don't need to be ignorant of the devil's devices. We've been indoctrinated, we've been taught. So we're not pushovers. 
They may try, but they're not going to succeed. Now, each of these ministries is used of God to build up the body of Christ. And they're interdependent. Not dependent, but interdependent. Or not independent, but interdependent. And that's how the body of Christ gets built up. Each ministry inter interdependent of the other. We could call this intersectionality. Say that. I know you don't hear the word very much. Intersectionality. There's a, each section being placed together, working together, well, greased by the Holy Spirit. And they're given for the responsibility of equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry that the whole body... You see, the work of the ministry is to equip all of us together so that the whole body, not just part of it, the whole body can be strengthened. Let's go to Ephesians 4.12. Let's look at that again. For, read with me real nice and loud so I don't have to say, please read. Or the, let me, you do it by yourself. Okay, here we go. Also, one, two, three, start. Wow. Who did you ever do good? I'm telling you, give yourself a hand. That was really, really super good. So every believer with the fivefold ministry as their cover. Now, a lot of churches have sided in side by side with us looking for a cover, and that's very legitimate. We have a lot of people, as I've told you from time, church service to service, Zambia, uh, and, and there's several, you know, we, we, Pakistan, was mentioned, Pakistan was mentioned earlier, but in, in Yemen, there's just different places. There's about five different countries that I know of that side in with us. Now, we're not legally connected, but they're allow, we allow them to use our name. They call themselves Trinity Gospel Temple of, of Yemen or whatever, wherever they are, Zambia, whatever they are. But it's proper because they feel maybe they're not a part of a denomination. So they're looking for some spiritual cover. And I, I appreciated the one, especially from Yemen, when it said, you know, Brother Dave, we started out with just 12 people. And we didn't know we didn't have a whole lot of support. So, so we happened to see you on television. We began to follow you. We went to your website. We downloaded all your materials and so on. You see, that's what we do. We make every, every outline that you get as you come to this service is out on the Internet, free. People can download it anywhere in the world. We don't copyright anything. Everything's available in Jesus' name. And so people are, and he said, Brother Dave, in six months we went from 12 to 56. Well, when you're in a nation like that of Muslims and all everything else, you know that that's a wonderful progress. So you just get the idea about this covering that we're talking about. Every believer with the fivefold ministry as their cover is to contribute. We don't just sit back, but we contribute our specialized talent and ability which God has given to us. And that others may benefit. We never have something from God that's just for us. God gave you something. If he gave you a word or he gave you some growth and some opened up some scripture to you, it's not just for you to selfishly just take for yourself. Every time you get a chance, share it. Because others like you are hungry and in need of help. First Corinthians chapter 12. Let's so We talked about spiritual gifts. We always think you know, the, the gifts that we enumerated are all of them in, in Ephesians. But look here, this is in Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And no one should be ignorant because it's very simple. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. I like the way he puts it, dumb idols. God got sick and tired of the Jews always having to have some idols. Dumb idols, however, you were led. That's the way you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. If you hear somebody cursing using the name of Jesus, they're just damning themselves. You don't have to do that. Maybe you ought to learn a little more of the English language. You don't have to curse so much. Blankety blank. I get so many blankety blanks, I can't even understand what you're trying to tell me. I'm telling you. Therefore, I make known to you, no one speaking the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that neat? There are diversity of gifts. Now watch, we're going to expand on those nine gifts. But the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. We don't always 
do it the same. Like we have two services. One I consider a contemporary style service. We're more of a traditional service in the second service. But nonetheless, we're on the same team. Same team. We serve in the same contractor. Hallelujah. We're just, he just subbed us out. We're just being used. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who worketh all in all. We're not going to be exactly the same as we operate. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now, let me tell you this. If someone who claims to have manifestations of the Holy Spirit in their life is selfish and they don't show the love of Christ, I wouldn't follow them. I don't care what they told me. I would not listen. If they don't have the character of Christ, the concern and compassion, all they want to be is on, in the front and just want to show off, then let them show off to somebody else. They're not showing off to me. <clears throat> you don't have to do what I do. I'm just letting you know how I exist. I think I better clear my throat a little bit. I don't know. <clears throat> Check out the atmosphere. A bit. One is given the word of wisdom. Now watch how this is given. One is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. A lot of different classes here. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing. Gifts, plurality there. We don't know what all that means. But well, one thing we know, know, you can pray for yourself. Any man ask, he shall receive. If any two on earth agree, they can do it that way. Two or three, they can do it that way. I'm in the midst. They can call for the elders of the church and the ministers, and they can anoint them with oil. We can lay hands on the sick. There's a lot of, maybe that's some of the idea of the variety of the gift there. So gifts of healing by the same spirit, then go on. To, uh, to another, the working of miracles. Now, a miracle is a little bit different than a healing. Healing, by its very nature, healing, it's in the process. You get prayed for, and God begins the miracle, it's not complete, so you're healing. It's, it's ongoing. But in the case of a miracle, which is less, uh, less let's say it happens less than healings, that's because of how we are and how we think and what limits we put on God. But a, a miracle is something that happens now. Just like Jesus, when he came to a man who had a, a withered arm, and he said, stretch forth your arm, then this is, a miracle would be immediately. You stretch out the hand from here to here. Right? That's a miracle. And to another word, to another prophecy. Now, let's, let's think about prophecy for a minute. Prophecy can be foretelling, but it's less likely to be foretelling than forthtelling. Let me tell you the difference. The reason foretelling was more important in the Scriptures is because they didn't have the Scriptures. And so everything had to be spelled out more or less by prophecy or whatever. But now that we have the Word of God, there's less need because we know what's going to happen, the Bible tells us. We don't have to prophesy about the end time. We have it written out for us in the Word of God. So there still is foretelling, but it would be less likely and less needed. But foretelling, think what foretelling would be. Supposing you know someone that's sick and uh, you feel a very strong impulse. Oh, I just, I've been, oh, honey, I've been thinking about that person all day. I just, I just feel that I have simple burden. What would be the wrong with going to that person and say, the Bible says, if any two on earth agree. And I want to, let's look that, let's read it. Let me take you by the hand. Let's agree together. Now, that's forth telling the gospel. And so I just want to give you the idea so you can see the difference. And another, to another discerning of spirits. Now what in the world is discerning of spirits? Well, it's not only discerning evil spirits, but believe it or not, you have to be, be able to discern the Spirit of God. Because, you know, a hundred ideas come to your mind. If you're like me, your, your ideas come so fast, sometimes you get mixed up because while you're talking something, something else is thinking in your mind. You can't say, Brother Dave, can you think something else while you're saying something? Yes, sometimes it happens. It gets a little confusing, though, once in a while. And I know you, you notice that when it happens to me. <laughs> Anyhow, but there are discerning spirits. So you can, you can di now look here. You can discern human spirits. You can discern your own spirit. Wait, my soul, only upon God. Paul, uh, David speaks to his own soul. He, he commands, he says, wait, my soul, only upon God. So it's possible that you're in your own mode of thinking, you mean well, and all of that, but it's you and not some supernatural intervention. 
You have to know the difference. And that's why that gift is given. Because, and you'll notice that when I pray for the sick, I don't always use the gifts of the Spirit. I can only, see the gifts are divided severally as he wills. Read it all. <clears throat> Doesn't say you can say, I have the gift. No, he, he's, the gifts of the Spirit, they remain his. He divides severally as it's needed in a given service. You know what I think potentially? I think that every person who is spirit-filled and reads the Bible, prays, and committed to Christ, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, I believe that potentially any of the gifts of the Spirit could operate in you as he sees fit. Now, for instance, if you come across someone that, that's, that, that really needs Christ and they don't know him, I mean, you're not going to speak in tongues 100 miles an hour and use that gift. They'll think you're crazy. Not time for that. Right then, what do they need? They, you, they, there needs to be some maybe discern of spirits. Let's, God will help you discern. How shall I pray for this person? I got to watch. I don't want to insult them. I don't want to drive them away. You see, there's all kinds of things that God can help you with. And you could do it intelligently. Some of you have driven your family away from you. They don't even want you to come to their house. Every time you step in the door, you better get saved or you're going to hell. Well, if you came in my house and I was unsaved, I'd probably knock you out of the house or something. No, I wouldn't. I mean, I used to be like, I'm not like that anymore. No. I'm such a nice person now. I can't hardly live with myself. Anyhow, I just... <laughs> Let's go to Romans chapter 12. I just have a lot of fun when I preach. I really do. Let me see how I'm doing time. Good. All right, 12th chapter. Now look at this. We're just building the case here. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. I think we, did we read part of this? Acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But let's go on. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. You got to be open to teaching or you'll never get renewed. And that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Our egos are so demanding. What to just to act like? What? I mean, can I tell? I'm going to tell on myself. I don't go around telling other people. Many of you remember Pastor Sorensen you know, of great ministry, you know, back in the 60s and 70s radio program, great ministry. And when I first came to Canton, you know, I, I graduated from Bible college, you know, and I was a minister, and I came, and I'd go to his church, we'd go to visit. <laughs> Sister Raleigh would say, why are you doing that? And I'd be sitting as high as I could. I was hoping he'd see me say, oh, Brother Dave's here in, our, in the congregation. Now, tell me this. What do you think that was? Plain ego. I wanted to be somebody and hadn't earned to be anybody. Uh, it's sickening, really, to see a person that this tries to dominate the scene or whatever. And so this is what this is about. Don't think of himself more highly. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't think of yourself highly. What you ought to think of, Lord, if... It, this, like, here's what Sister Merlin and Merlin and I said today. She said something to me like, I'm so glad that we're here today. I said, yes, darling, me too. I feel like we're on extended time, and each day God gives us another extension, another day. You know, just humbly walking and doing the best you can. Hey, use your talent, use your ability, do everything you can. But remember, if it wasn't for the main contractor, you wouldn't be even needed. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, but to think, how should we think? Soberly. Think about it before you do something. Don't be hog wild and go crazy. As God has dealt each one a measure of faith, God gives you enough to operate on. For we have many members in one body. And that's what we're learning. You think it's easy for two fellowships like ours to come together? If it weren't for the Holy Spirit oiling the wheels as they turn, it wouldn't be possible because God different cultures can be developed in different ministries. But when, when God's in it, God can take two people and put them together. Hallelujah. Watch my fingers. I don't want to lose my Bible. And he does this to it. Hallelujah. Yeah, I'm talking about what God can do. But that's a Holy Spirit thing. Let's, let's see. We have many members. Let's go on down a little bit. Because I want to read some more. For, so we being many are one body. That's what's hard to understand. Many talents, many characteristics, many ethnicities, many colors. But 
being one. Being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. That's why we're interlocked. Having then, now watch, we're building a case here. Then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Not everyone is the same. None of our fingerprints are the same. Of all the six or seven billion people in the world, not one person has a duplicate of fingerprints like somebody else. It's just the way God made us. So then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering. Now watch. See, these are gifts go beyond the nine. I'm talking about ministering here. He who teaches, ministry of teaching, that's part of the ministry too, and shows mercy with cheerfulness. So there's an interesting portion of Scripture. Let's go to 1 Peter and chapter 4. Let's just kind of just keep building this little building here. Each one has received a gift, or as each one has received. See, that presumes that every person that's born again has received a gift. May not be the same as somebody else. I don't want to be somebody else. When I first started, I didn't know any better. I tried to be like Billy Graham. The Bible says. And I tried to be like, like Oral Roberts. Be thou made whole. Well, because I, I had this, they, they were just favorites of mine, so I, I finally learned I had to be myself. Boy, I don't know if you went through this, Dr. Gamble, but I went through a period of time when the faith movement got real big, oh, God, every week, ten tapes came in. This is from Copeland, this is Hagen, this is over here, this, all these tapes. I was supposed to listen to all these tapes. I was getting dizzy trying to listen to all those tapes. <laughs> you know, God doesn't expect us to be like somebody else. You can be edified and blessed by somebody else. But let God use you. You, have, you can't force your personality and make it like somebody else's. I know at times, Sister Merlene wished I could have <laughs> changed my personality in, in the pulpit. And, yeah, and, and the only reason I didn't get to, get to make sure that Sister Merlene got, didn't get a microphone, because <laughs> we would be preaching duet sermons every month. You know, she'd straighten me out. Let me just tell you one thing. That's the sweetest girl I ever met in my life. I know where I'd be if I didn't have her. But we're like living stones. Every other temple in the Old Testament and had priesthood and sacrifices. Look at, look at 1 Peter 2.5. We're, go, we're going on now. For this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. How do you put the silence to the foolish ignorant men? By doing good. Say, well, I didn't know. I thought there was just a bunch of quacks over there. I didn't know they were changing lives. I didn't know that those carnations that they put out front meant something. It meant that 11 young boys received Jesus as Lord of their life in the gymnasium this week. I'm telling you, things are happening. They're happening so fast, I can't keep up with it. All right, 1 Peter 2.15, did we read that already? 2.15, okay. For this will of God, that doing good you may put aside. We did that already, that's good. All right, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. See, we're letting the Bible do the preaching a little bit here. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, had to be made like his brethren. Say that, had to be made like his brethren. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. How could he be a good high priest if he didn't love the people he dealt with? If he didn't feel their pain, so to speak that he might be merciful and faithful, I priest, in the things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He had to be concerned. He had to feel it. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and so on. So it's very clean and very plain there. Let's go to the fourth chapter, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Now watch it. If we have a high priest, there must be other priests underneath him. You don't have a high priest if there's not other priests. <clears throat> Are you, did you get that? Some of you got over there. I, li I like that. I'm not close enough, but praise God. Come up here real fast. Come on, come run up here. Praise God. Dang. Oh, hallelujah. 
Well, that makes you want to, I'm telling you. So then we, <laughs> I, lo I love, I just love this place. I had you know why? Because I would never fit any place else, so you stuck with me. You don't have to worry about me going somewhere else. No one else would have me. All right, let's read this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. He's got the experience, folks. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast tenaciously. Hang on. Don't give up. You're on the brink of a miracle. Do not give up, I said. Turn, turn to your neighbor and say, don't give up. <laughs> Seeing then we have a great high priest. And so let us hold fast our confession. Let's see. Let's go to the sixth chapter, verse 20. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, the forerunner. He's the template. He's the example. And I want to take him by the hand, and I want to run with him. There's been so many good things happening, Brother Dana. I've been having time. You know, I hope you don't mind me calling this Brother Dana, but, you know, the Dr. Dana, you know what I mean. Sometimes I can say, hey, is this the Reverend Doctor? You know, so we do all that, too. But when you're close friends, you kind of just tend to, you know. But, you know, we, I, I told him this past week, I said, Dane, we're going to ask, put these kind of shoes away. Let's get our sneakers on. Let's get our running shoes on. My Lord, things are happening so fast and we're trying to keep up with God. He is the funnest person to serve in your whole life once you get, once you get acquainted with him and know, and know how to listen. <laughs> Hallelujah. This, I don't know why it makes me want to do that. I, I wish I could do that. You, no, you have to have sisters around you because if you don't, you might fall down and hurt yourself. It's just fun, I'm telling you. Because there's a high priest, it implies that there are a myriad of other priests. Do you know God considers us a priest and a king? We're not maybe in the physical position to exercise that authority, but in his sight, we're, we're priests and kings. He just loves for us to come. You never notice you don't ever have to, you don't have to make an appointment with God? Did you ever notice you didn't have to call, hello? Uh, you'll have to wait, please. There's, there'll be four, there are four, four people ahead of you. Please wait. There's three people ahead of you, 16 minutes later. No, there's two people ahead of you. Half hour later, you fell asleep. There's one person, then you didn't hear them when they told you that it was them. You missed the whole call. It's not like that with God. You don't even have to knock. You can walk right in. You're somebody. You've been, you've been made into a character that is, that is acceptable to the Lord. And he says, come on in. Don't you like that kind of relationship? Come on in. Sit down. Let's have a cup of java. Let's hang out together. Let's go here. Let's go there. Let's do this. Let's do that. And to say, God, do you like my company? He says, I just love your company, Brother Dave. Well, you say, that may be a figment of imagination, but sure does work with me. Hallelujah. Priests of God. That's what the Bible says. I wish I could get this all. Let's go to Hebrews 13 and 15. I want to show you something. I mentioned to you that all throughout the Bible, whether everybody had an altar, Elijah, or Moses, they all had an altar where they could worship and they could offer sacrifices. What are we going to do in the New Testament when we don't have sacrifice? We don't have to kill bulls and rams and pigeons and all the rest or doves, whatever it happens to be. Therefore, by him, this is a mandate for every Christian. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. You don't have to kill any animals, but as you walk into his presence, just say, Father, I thank you and I praise you. I glorify your fantastic, stupendous name. Just tell him how much you love him. Say, you're outstanding, Lord. I give you praise and obeisance and, Lord, I just everything I have. Therefore, let him offer the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips. Think of that. Here you are, an earthly being. And he says, I care about what comes out of your mouth. Let me know. Praise me. Let me know you love me. Remember now, God doesn't want to force you. He wants you to want him. And I've been trying my best to get you to want him. Oh, if you really learn to want the Lord, he can do such great things with you. In Jesus' name, there's no, oh, I have so much, can't get into all of it. But in the last part of the notes, you can see for yourself, how can we offer sacrifice? We can offer ourselves, 
lot of scripture. God wants to use your members for his glory. We can offer him our time. And that's why when we go to the Lord in prayer, you know, we see some great men of the past. And like Martin Luther King. I'm not Martin Luther King. He did great in our present time. But Martin Luther from the past. And Martin Luther prayed six hours a day. I don't know how he got anything else done. But he felt that that was so important. And any wonder he could change Christendom by nailing a 98 thesis on his, on his door. And he taught the people, we live by faith and not by works. And he taught the whole teaching of faith and it caused the reformation of which all of us are enjoying and are part of today. Our substance. Folks, I don't know how many people think you're trying to take your money. Let me just tell you something. If you think I'm trying to take your money, please keep it. I do not want it. When we ask you to give your tithes and offerings, we're trying to help you, believe it or not. I know ministers get a terrible reputation. <laughs> the Bible says to bring, and he even says, prove me and see. See, this is one of the ways that we can be that servant that he wants us to be. This is one of the ways to be that subcontractor he's called us to be. Some of you are never going to be in a position like I am, but you're just as valuable because if I didn't have people like you that support the ministry, there wouldn't be a ministry like this or Dr. Dana's or, or Brother Kelly's or, or, or the, I mean, or Bobby and, and Bob Cook. I mean, there wouldn't be, those ministries would not be. It takes people giving and what a fair share if you make a lot give those big checks we kid about it but I've seen some big checks do you know that when we celebrate our 50th anniversary someone that did not come to our church it'd probably be someone you wouldn't think of gave us a check and they gave us how was that they gave us a thousand dollars for every year we're celebrating our 50th and when we looked at the check, it was for $50,000. Now, let me just tell you this. That is a lot. Believe me, it is a lot. But remember this. When you write out a check for 500 and it's a, it's, it's a sacrifice for you, you know in the eyes of God, it's just as worth those large figures. That's why it's a fair share program. And so if you're not tithing, you're just hurting your future. Because if we don't tithe, we're really using his money and that's like stealing. Dr. Hagee's more firm about it. He says, that's like stealing his money. I say like using his money. Hagee's got a little more nerve than me. He says, if you're using God's money, you're stealing from God. Praise God. Always. Not making fun. I just wish I could do that. If you ever heard C.M. Ward, you hear him. You know, it just goes, kind of goes down the line and so on. All right, our fruit, all kind of good stuff here. Now, let me, do, let me do something with you, okay? I don't want to cuss because I don't believe in cussing. But I really get mad at the devil. So you don't have to listen to this. But I want to tell the devil off. So since I can't cuss, I got to approach it in the way that I can. So I'm going to speak on behalf of all of you. Devil, be on notice. We are purposefully about you, Satan, you diabolical, unadulterated, nefarious reprobate. You are a duplicitous, cunning, uncouth, eventuate. You don't know what eventuate means. I know what it means. It means you're fading away. <laughs> you're a being. You're a banal. You're a banal attitude is trite and passe. We're not ignorant of your devices, you foul spirit. You are doomed for your dastardly deeds and you will irrevocably endure eternity in hell in the conflagration of fire burning fire forever, you foul spirit. <laughs> We're not allowed to cuss at him. You know what somebody else might be saying about him. He's interfered in our life long enough. It's, bless God, it's time to stop being afraid. Brother Dave, you better stop doing it like that. Don't you know the devil will come if you keep doing that? I, I'm not afraid of the devil. Never was. 
I learned about him in the Bible. I learned that if you have fear, fear has torment, but perfect love casts out all fear. I learned that there's power in prayer. You don't have to travel a thousand miles or five thousand miles to get to somebody that has some special formula. I'm thinking about you. Why you can look the devil in the eye and say, you BB-eyed, you fake, you fraud you in the name. That's what he is. He's a liar and he's a father of all liars. I come against you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, whom you fear. Get out of my house. Get out of my life. Get out of my body. I declare liberty. I declare freedom. I'm healed. I declare divine health. Come on, stand on your feet. Give him a shout and a praise. <laughs>